to the May 8th, 2013 meeting of the Suburban Detroit Detroit General Neurology Support Group. And we welcome all those people that are picking us up on the facial pain network that uh, TNA has set up. Uh, hello to Yoko in Japan, uh, Pat in South Africa, and Fernick in uh, Toronto, as well as all those people in the U.S. that are, that are picking up our videos now. Uh, we're pleased to have uh, Dr. Edgar Grills, who's a radiation oncologist here at uh, Beaumont with us again. I think you've spoken at least two or three times okay. before. So we're going to get an, an update <laughs> on the uh, facility. And you might go over exactly uh, uh, how it's set up in terms of it's here at Beaumont, but it's uh, run by or owned by a separate group. Sure. Is that just briefly. Yeah, we don't have to get into all the details. And I also okay. want to thank them again personally for the contribution. We received the largest contribution we've ever received uh, $500 from this organization uh, here a couple months ago. I, I put in the cover letter that we received the greatest one, but I just I never put the amounts of any of the physicians or hospitals or members of the Tricycles that have uh, contributed to us, but uh, we uh, thank you for the support. You're on. No thank you. problem. Well, Tim asked if I would, I, so I am a radiation oncologist here at Beaumont, um, and uh, I do quite a bit of stereotactic radio surgery, not just for trigeminal neuralgia, but for, for other things. Um, Tim mentioned um, to kind of tell you a little bit about the setup here at Beaumont with the Gamma Knife. Um, it is uh, Greater Michigan Gamma Knife is kind of an independent company from Beaumont, but it's a partnership with Beaumont. So um, there are a number of, uh, when, when it, the center was set up, it was set up as an open model to kind of involve as many, you know, neurosurgeons and um, radiation oncologists and medical oncologists because we treat other conditions on the machine as well as um, neurootologists um, who also sometimes are involved in the treatment of trigeminal neuralgia but also a lot for acoustic neuromas. Um, and other tumors that can occur in the head and neck area. So it's a very collaborative approach to the treatment and we do everything really, you know, in a unified manner. Um, so, you know, I work very closely with the neurosurgeons, um, you know, in the care of the patients on the actual treatment that day. Um, and it's truly a, a combined effort. So we learn a lot from each other. They learn from me about radiation. I learn from them about the neurosurgical procedures. I mean, I probably know a lot more about neurosurgical procedures for trigeminal neuralgia um, now than I otherwise um, would have if we didn't have kind of such a collaborative group. So it's a great environment um, to work in. And if you were to come to see me and I thought that Gamonite was not better for you, that you'd be better served by a microvascular compression or some other kind of surgery, then you know, I would be telling you that and sending you to the do you ever get into a discussion in your presentation the gamma knife relative to a cyber knife, or do you stay away I from that have, discussion? I, I do have a little bit, uh, okay. a, a couple okay. slides um, on gamma knife versus no. cyber knife. So you, just wait till you get to it. Then sure. you don't have to go. Yeah. Well, start. I'll just go Thank through you. the slides. I don't have all that. It's not super long, so you know there'll be plenty of chance to ask questions um, for anybody that has them. So. I, you know, you guys are very well versed in, in a lot of this, but um, you know that trigeminal neuralgia is a debilitating nerve disorder that affects uh, four to five people per 100,000 yearly, um, usually classified by sudden, typically unilateral, severe, brief, stabbing, recurrent episodes of pain in branches of the fifth cranial nerve or the trigeminal nerve. If, it's, if somebody truly has um, trigeminal neuralgia in the absence of ever having any kind of um, treatment or procedure for it, it's not normally associated with symptoms like facial numbness or weakness, weakness of the eye or trouble with the vision. And all of those are you know, signs or symptoms to us that the person could have something other than trigeminal neuralgia that we would be concerned about. Um, because trigeminal neuralgia is basically a, a medical diagnosis of exclusion. We have to rule out that there's any other anatomic cause for it, including things like tumors or other structural problems that could occur in the base of the skull or that somebody might have multiple sclerosis as the cause of their trigeminal neuralgia. Um, so in the absence of any of those other things, it's typically caused by com vascular compression of the fifth nerve um, leading to demyelination. In other words, it basically rubs off the protective lining that normally protects the nerve, and then that's when the patients get those shooting pulses of pain. 
um, if somebody has MS, then that's just demyelination of the nerve, just like they could have demyelination anywhere else in the central nervous system related to the MS. So the, tr the treatment approach um, in MS patients can be a little bit different. Um, so most of you probably know this, but the first line treatment for patients who are diagnosed with trigeminal neuralgia is, is medical management. Um, so we'll typically always try medications first um, before we think about doing other invasive um, types of procedures. So if somebody had very severe acute pain, um, intravenous medications might be considered. That's a relatively rare scenario where somebody ends up in the emergency room and they actually you know, would get loaded on intravenous medications. The most um, common and kind of the, the classic um, medication that's used is Tegretol or, or carbamazepine. Um, and if, if someone um, is initially has what seems like trigeminal neuralgia, that's commonly the medication that they'll be given, and if that makes the pain go away, that's almost gives you the diagnosis that that's, that's what the person has. So commonly that'll be the first medication that will be tried, but not always especially depending on you know, the, the person's age and other medical conditions because it could interfere with, with um, certain other medications, but it's one of the common ones that's used. And there are a whole number of other medications that um, many of them are in the anti-seizure category. Some of them are in more like the antidepressant category, um, but a, a number of them are listed here. And oftentimes by the time somebody would show up in my office, they've already been on a series of all kinds of different medications. They may have had trigeminal neuralgia for many years or they may have had it for a short period of time, but they've typically been tried on multiple medications, none of which have really been successful. Or they worked for a period of time, but now the medicines just aren't working anymore. So um, this is a graph. Um, we use um, this guideline. It's pretty um, consistent with kind of what we do in our clim clinical practice. Um, so once patients have failed medical treatment, for trigeminal neuralgia. In young patients, um, excluding patients with multiple sclerosis, um, typically we'll recommend a microvascular decompressive surgery, which involves a posterior facet craniotomy. Um, and the reason that we do that, I'll show you a couple of slides, is because that is the procedure when it works, it, it can work very well and it can give people very long lasting pain relief. It's the, the only treatment really that has you know, documented data that says it could work for 15 to 20 years and somebody can have long standing pain. Um, for older patients, patients who don't want surgery or patients who aren't candidates for surgery, um, the two main types of procedures that we consider are either a rhizotomy or stereotactic radiosurgery. If the patient is not having acute pain, meaning pain right now, very severe, um, that's when we would lean potentially more toward the stereotactic radio surgery. The problem with radio surgery or gamma knife is that it takes a period of time for it to work versus when you have surgery, whether that be a microvascular decompression or a rhizotomy using radio frequency or some other type, those procedures work immediately to help with the pain versus the gamma knife has a delayed effect. So it generally takes several weeks for the treatment to actually um, be effective. So if somebody is in very, very severe acute pain, um, that might be a reason to, to lean away from it if you can't control them, you know, reasonably well with medications in the meantime. So um, the Barrow Neurological Institute Pain Intensity Score, or the BNI score, is a, a common um, score that we use to evaluate treatment response for patients who are treated for trigeminal neuralgia. Um, and you're, you would be in the best category if, if we can get you at a one. Um, we still consider it a treatment success if we can get you to be a two or a three. But basically, if you had a BNI score of one, you would have no pain and require no medication. If you were a two, sometimes pain, but not necessarily requiring medication. And a three, some pain, but it's adequately controlled with medication. And four or five is patients who really have no relief or have some, or, or they do have pain, but it's not adequately controlled with medications. So if you're in the one to three category, that's usually after you have a treatment, that's what people would consider a good or an excellent treatment response to whatever uh, the treatment is, whether it would be gamma knife or some other surgical therapy. So 
here are the different surgeries that can be done. Um, we mentioned microvascular decompression, which for um, those of you who don't know what that is, if we think that the, the problem is that there is a, a, a blood vessel that sits next to the nerve, puts pressure on it, um, and kind of pulsates up against the nerve, what they do is they go in and they put a piece of Teflon-like material between the, the, the blood vessel and the nerve so that it can't push up against there and continue to, to rub the lining off. Um, and then there are, is a rhizotomy. Um, it's, a, it's a less invasive um, procedure um, where they go in and they will use radio frequency typically. Um, glycerol rhizotomy is not used as commonly nowadays. Uh, part of that I think is because the glycerol that they used to use isn't, isn't necessarily available. But most of our neurosurgeons typically use radio frequency when they're doing rhizotomies. And we would consider these lesioning um, procedures because basically what they're doing is they're, they're going in and burning the nerve, um, causing a lesion in the nerve um, so that it can't send out the pulses. And gamma knife would be most similar to a lesioning type procedure. With a gamma knife um, with radiation, we're not doing anything to, to physically move a blood vessel away from a nerve. Um, we're just trying to inactivate the nerve by giving it a high dose. So here are the results that I showed you. I mentioned um, if somebody has a microvascular decompressive surgery um, that it can work very well. And that's where you see these graphs where we're going out to, to 20 years. So this is the probability of success. Um, and then this is time at the bottom. Um, and you can see you have patients who are out here even 15 to 20 years later with about a 75% success rate. Um, so, so that's pretty high. Um, and why you consider this in younger patients. So certainly if a, if a younger patient comes into my office, they've failed medical therapy, they've never seen a neurosurgeon, um, the first thing I'm gonna say is, well, um, these are the different options that you have. I would emphasize this one the most and tell them that I thought that this was probably the best procedure for them um, and send them to see the neurosurgeon to talk about their options. Um, this basically just states what I said is that microvascular decompression generally is the best treatment for young healthy patients who have typical pain um, without multiple sclerosis who are candidates to have some kind of invasive surgical procedure. Um, it has a great deal of durability when it works and there are open techniques. Um, the open techniques are most common but we do have some um, surgeons who know how to do this procedure endoscopically which is a bit less invasive way of doing it. Um, and has less recovery uh, time. Um, but not all surgeons are skilled in um, the endoscopic techniques. Yeah, we're familiar with Dr. Piper, who does right. it. Yeah, and, and I work quite a bit with Dr. Right. Piper, so I know that yeah. you know he, he can do this endoscopically, um, but not everyone can, so it is a, a less invasive way to have a craniotomy um, with a shorter recovery time. And you have just a, that basically would make a small burr hole as opposed to making a big incision all the way behind the ear. Yeah, he knows that I've recommended him for the TNA conference in San Diego in October. Oh, okay. We just haven't heard back uh, oh, okay. that he could speak to the endoscopic, because we've had at least five or six people have had the endoscopic MBD successfully by uh -huh. Dr. Piper, so. Well, good. Well, I can bug him if you want to try to get him to come. No, 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 he's, <laughs> agreed. he's agreed to come. We haven't received an acceptance by the national oh, organization. Okay, perfect. All right, They're waiting saying. to see how many of the. I'll keep on them if you need it. No, okay. okay. How many of the members that are on the board are coming to speak? So it's kind of a political issue right now. Gotcha. Determining okay. who's going to speak. Okay. Um, so GM and I, uh, like I said, is typically used in older patients who don't have um, severe acute pain um, because of this delayed time to relief, which is usually in the range of two to eight weeks, but commonly three to four weeks. Um, the results in success and the durability are overall simil very similar to a rhizotomy, um, but the potential advantage advantages of gamma knife over rhizotomy is that it's less invasive, um, it, it causes less numbness, and there's a lower risk of anesthesia dolorosa or having corneal problems, in other words, problems with the eye reflex. So, um, Stereotactic radio surgery can be done using multiple different types of treatment machines. Um, radio surgery is the general term, but there are lots of different machines that can be used to deliver stereotactic radiation. 
Um, for trigeminal neuralgia, we consider gaminite radiosurgery the, the gold standard, and there are a few reasons for that. Um, there are other radiosurgery systems that are linear accelerator based that can also deliver radiosurgery. Um, you've probably heard of the CyberKnife or seen CyberKnife um, billboards. There's a machine called a Novalis. We have another, um, our, our treatment machines that are not the Yemenite, but even within Beaumont, we also have the ability to do serotactic radio surgery on those linear accelerator based machines, but we would not recommend that for, for trigeminal neuralgia. Um, the Yemenite, it, it uses a frame based system versus these other systems are, are frameless and there's a greater degree of accuracy when you're using the frame based system as well as there's difference in the, the fall off dose for the radiation. So typically um, what this is is a, is a brain MRI and this is the brain stem, okay, this is the root entry zone, so this is the trigeminal nerve going into the meccus cave and then it splits off, they show you here, into the three divisions of the trigeminal nerve, one that supplies the upper part of the base, one the mid part, and one the lower part. When we do, uh, when we treat patients with radiation, um, we are directing the radiation typically at this mid portion of the nerve. So it, can, it would affect the pain regardless of the division of the nerve that is, you know, involved with the trigeminal neuralgia because we're, we're treating before it splits into the three divisions. But this is the area where we're targeting the radiation. Where does it split exactly again? Uh, out here. So you show you see this okay. V1, V2, okay. and V3. Oh, I see. Yeah. That's how we Got usually re refer to them. That's the first, yeah. second, and third right. division. So you of go the just before it. Yeah. Just before it. So okay. V1 is the top, V2 yeah. is the middle, and V3 yeah. is the bottom. Um, and so this area here is called a ganglion. It's like where all that central communication occurs um, for, for that particular cranial nerve. This just shows you a couple of the other systems. This is the CyberKnife here at the bottom. This is a Novalis. These, again, are frameless systems, and there's limited data on the treatment of patients with trigeminal neuralgia, uh, specifically for linear accelerator-based accelerator -based radio surgery. There's not much data. Um, there are some data um, using CyberKnife stereotactic radio surgery, um, but what it, the main thing to note here is that the largest series um, that reports on cybernetic patients has fairly what we would consider significant risk of complications um, because these things are things that we very uncommonly would see after someone is treated with a gamma knife. I've never had a patient that had a weak foot or a dry eye syndrome or their hearing was affected by the, the treatment. Hearing um, is controlled by an entirely different cranial nerve. Um, muscle weakness, um, the fifth nerve also is um, or masticator weakness, this is, that's like the jaw muscle. Um, that would be an extremely rare complication. Again, of gamma knife, I've never actually seen a patient in my own practice that actually developed um, masticator weakness from gamma knife or developed um, trismus, which is where you would get very bad spasm and not be able to open the mouth completely. So this shows you the difference here. I know the lines, that it's you can't see them perfectly between a gamma knife treatment plan and a treatment plan with the cyber knife machine. And the main thing to note are these dose lines of radiation and how they spread out much greater on the cyber knife machine, which in, in this case is not, we don't consider that a positive thing in the treatment. Some things when you treat with radiation, you're trying to treat a large area, you're trying to cover, you know, tumor extension somewhere. But in this case, we're trying to give very focused radiation just to that nerve without affecting this very important part of the brain, the brain stem, um, where the roots of the nerves are and where there are a lot of other very important involuntary functions like breathing. Um, so we uh, would like to deliver as little dose of radiation to this area of the brain called the brain stem. This is the, the temporal lobe over here. Um, and so what you see here are that the dose lines go out farther on the CyberKnife plan, whether you're looking at this 10% line or this 30% line as compared to the GammaKnife plan, this is the 10% line. And the green line here is the 30%. The, the yellow line is the 50% line, which is the dose line that we're looking at primarily when we, when we put what we call that shot of radiation, which is kind of the isocenter, the center of the beams where all the x-ray beams meet. A gamma knife uses 201 
cobalt sources of radiation all centrally focused at that spot where we put the, the center of the shot on the nerve. And how many grays do you use again? Just we usually um, give um, 40 gray to the 50% isodose line, which is an equivalent of 80 gray at the center. Um, the range that's felt to be effective generally is somewhere between 70 and 90 gray. Um, we would only use generally the 70 gray dose and mm -hmm. someone who's previously already had gamma knife and we're using and we're treating them a second time. Um, we can typically um, repeat the gamma knife procedure once, but usually won't do it more than twice. There's been a very rare instance where a patient has been treated three times. Um, so usually our standard dose is 80 gray maximum. There are places that use, use higher dose. Um, the higher dose may have a higher um, rate of causing patients numbness. Uh, this just shows that in patients who have um, a contraindication to MRI for some reason, so say they have some kind of metal or a pacemaker or, or something like that that would prevent them from being able to have an MRI, that doesn't mean that they can't be treated with a gamma knife because we can still use, a, unfortunately, a lumbar puncture. Um, and then we can just use a CAT scan uh, but use contrast actually in the spinal fluid that still allows us to perfectly see the nerve here. It's just a more invasive way to do the procedure because you have to put the patient through a lumbar puncture. But it just means that if, say, the patient had cardiac issues, has a pacemaker, that doesn't mean they wouldn't be a candidate to have treatment with a gamma knife. Um, this is just a little hard to see here, but th this is a summary of some of the series. Um, for patients treated with gamma knife. And again, these are all series using gamma knife radio surgery, not linear accelerator based radio surgery. Looking at outcomes at one, two, and three years here. And it's really, really busy, so it's a little a bit hard for you to look at good. They, they separate in the, them into excellent and good. So this would generally be in the BNI one to three range if you combine the excellent or good. So you're looking at about you know, 75% there over here, and around 65 to 70% at three years. Uh, the next slide I have them kind of manually done. Where if you look at overall response rates um, for gamma knife um, in these series, meaning the probability that the person would initially have pain relief, that they would have some response, is generally in the range of you know, 85 to 90%, um, but somewhere between 15 to 30% of patients might develop um, recurrence. The rates of numbness, if you look at across these series, um, averaged around 16%. Usually you'll see that anywhere between, you know, 15 to, to 30%. Uh, percent. So patients may develop numbness, but again, anesthesia, anesthesia dolorosa, which is more like painful numbness in the face, is very rare after gamma knife, but more commonly I've heard that somebody has had a rhizotomy. So um, here are some slides specifically um, about the Beaumont gamma knife. So this just shows you overall all the some of the various different kinds of things that we treat um, with, with the machine. Uh, a fair number of our patients have tumors that have spread to the brain from some other part of the, of the body, um, and that's this slice of the pie. Um, this is the percentage of our patients that actually have trigeminal neuralgia. So it's a pretty large percentage actually of all the patients that we treat. About 15% of all our patients we're treating for trigeminal neuralgia. Acoustic neuromas, 9%, um, uh, those are benign uh, tumors that occur on the hearing and balance nerve. We treat a lot of meningiomas, which are also benign tumors. We treat pituitary adenomas, which are which are benign tumors. But again, just to show you kind of an idea, of, we treat lots of different things on the gamma knife, but of all the things that we treat, trigeminal neuralgia is actually one of our fairly common ones. Um, this just shows you, uh, so th this is this just percentage of our patients that have had um, one, two, or three treatments. So the vast majority, 85% of our patients have had gamma knife once, but we have 14% of patients have had uh, two treatments, and just 1%, like I said, it's uncommon that we treat people a third time. Um, but has happened in a, in a few cases. So this is a 
fairly updated number. Um, this 255. That's since um, 2000, like the end of 2006, beginning of 2007. Um, a lot of our patients have had prior surgical procedures um, before having undergone, uh, before undergoing gamma knife. So this. This just gives you a breakdown of that. So 48% of them had had a prior MVD, 12% um, a glycerol rhizotomy, 34% a radiofrequency rhizotomy, 2% um, a balloon compression, and 4% in another category. And sometimes those are little whole, you know, nerve blocks or other things. So a lot of our patients have had other surgical procedures prior to having gamonite. So having had a procedure before doesn't mean that the gamonite won't work. Um, and we can, I, I'll show you some graphs that show results in patients who have had prior surgery procedures um, versus not. So um, we recently looked at our outcomes only in 141 of the cases because uh, we like to have patients have sufficient follow-up such that we know whether the treatments work. And um, you know we do contact patients by phone um, sometimes and, and try try to get follow-up data on them if they haven't been in some. You know, patients will always come see you if they're having pain, but sometimes if they're doing well, um, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily um, see them uh, because they, they don't feel that you need to check in. So we like to have a way to, um, you know, follow up with people even if they haven't come in. Um, so uh, for all of our patients, 91% um, of them had an initial pain response or success. So that means in that category of one to three. So either no pain, no medication, occasional pain but no medication, or um, a, a, occasional pain but controlled with medication. Um, and 30% of patients overall have developed a recurrent pain or ended up in this PNI or five category. This, these are just the patient characteristics overall for people that we have um, treated. So. The median age is 70, but we've treated people from the age of 29 to as high as 94. Um, most of our patients have more typical trigeminal neuralgia symptoms, so that classic, you know, sharp shooting, electric, shark-like pain. Um, but we have a fair percentage of patients, close to, you know, 20% that have some atypical features to their pain. Um, so maybe it's the more burning or it's a little more constant, um, you know, some of those other, other uh, characteristics. And when you're in this category, the neurosurgeons are less likely to offer you, um, you know, the classic procedure. They're less likely to offer you a microvascular decompression um, because the success rate might not be as high. Um, we have treated patients with MS as well. It tends to be a much smaller percentage of our overall population. And um, like I showed you on the last slide, 35% of our patients have had some kind of prior surgery. And here you see the vast majority of them get that 40 grade to the 50% ISOS line um, or 80 grade maximum. Um, we're usually using just one, what we call ISO center or shot for the radiation. It's only four millimeters. Um, big, so it's very small. The target here, um, I showed you on the on the MRI. You see how small it is, um, which is why the accuracy of the gamma knife being less than a millimeter is very important because the target is very tiny. Um, mm -hmm. Therefore, you want the accuracy of the treatment with the frame, um, and that's why we also use a combination of CT and MRI to verify the accuracy um, of the treatment uh, because what we're treating is so small. Um, so this is, if you look at our entire patient population, so freedom from pain recurrent after the gamma knife. So time at the bottom, this is the percent of patients um, who were pain free. Um, if you look out at three years, you're looking at a number around 70% of patients being pain free. Um, if you go out farther, we just don't even have as many patients out, the, out this, this far. Um, but you can, we have had patients with lo more long-standing pain relief. Most gamma knife series, whether it's ours or anybody else's, it's the follow-up that's reported is not usually too far beyond the three to five year range as far as the studies that we actually have in the literature. It's just that nobody is, not too many people have reported out at, you know, eight years, 10 years, and we won't gain that with, you know, until we have further follow-up and since we 
at the Gamma Knife Pier in December of 2006. You know, we just really started treating patients in 2006, so we wouldn't have even 10 years of follow-up yet to, to report. Now, other groups are using this besides your group as well, right? Are using... Um, the Gamma Knife facility? Uh, you, do you mean other groups besides Beaumont? Right. Uh, yeah, like I described before, the, the Beaumont is an... The right. Gamma Knife is sort of an open model, so it right. includes neurosurgeons that you know don't just work or operate at Beaumont that you know are affiliated with other hospitals as well as neuro otologists and, and mm -hmm. radiation oncologists. But this data is just for what your group did. Wouldn't include everything that was done at that center. This includes right. all Beaumont patients. Right. Regardless of who did their treatment. So oh. this is all Bo all Beaumont patients. So if somebody came from DMC and used that facility it would include that? If the patient got their gamma knife at Beaumont, yes. Okay. If the patient had their gamma knife at the DMC, no, 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 no. Understand. But if the patient had their gamma knife at Beaumont, yes, they would. So it is, even if it's an outside neurosurgeon doing it, this, is, this covers all of that. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't okay. matter who the neurosurgeon was as long got as it. the treatment was done. It was at here, Beaumont. okay. Um, because all of our patients at the time that they have their treatment are, you know, asked whether or not. Sure their information can be used to, re to report outcomes. Okay. Um, and so we have a, a database that's approved by the hospital okay. IRB and everything. So okay. we, we follow all, all of our patients as close as possible. Mm -hmm. Every time we treat a patient with the gamma knife, their information automatically goes into the database yeah. um, for the treatment unless the patient has specifically indicated that they didn't okay. want their yeah. information. Okay. You come up with treatment plan? Yes, it's myself and the neurosurgeon and the radiation physicist. We all sit down at the computer together and we map out the nerve um, and we place, we decide where we want to put the radiation and we all approve the plan. Even um, if it's a, a neurosurgeon from DMC using facility, you're involved all the time? Yes. Okay. Uh, again, my treatment plan yeah. has to be signed, actually physically signed according to the NRC, um, yeah. you know, by the physicist. The yeah. radiation oncologist and, and the neurosurgeon. Um, so that's how it's so set they, up. They don't bring their own. Right. We have our own physicist. They don't bring their physicist. Yeah, that's my question. Yeah, so you right. and Ann are working close together. Ann Mates is a physicist. Yes, Ann Mates is our a primary physicist for the gamma knife. We do have other physicists that, that do gamma knife treatment, but okay. um, Ann is doing the gamma knife the vast majority of the time, and unless she's on vacation or. You know, she her primary uh, responsibility within our department is is gamma knife. She doesn't really do physics for our linear accelerators, right. um, as opposed to our other physicists do. So, are there other Dr. Grills that are doing like when you're away too? Yeah, we have other radiation oncologists um, that okay. that perform gamma knife as well. You know, uh, okay. two of my partners, Dr. Peter Chen and, and Dr. Dan Krause, um, both do. Okay. I probably treat the largest number of patients in the yeah. game night, but yeah, um, we have um, other radiation oncologists too. So, and um, you know, we tend to see more cases from certain neurosurgeons than others, just dependent on on their practice, you know, makeup, mm -hmm. what their mm -hmm. what the primary things they okay. treat are. Um, so this looks um, at patients, the outcomes of patients who have had no prior surgery, so it would be the dark line versus patients who have had prior surgery. And what you see here, this is, we call this a p-value, I don't know how much any of you know about statistics, but if this number were less than 0 .05, it would mean that there's a statistically significant difference between those two curves, and what this tells you is that there's not. So whether a patient had prior surgery or not doesn't um, predict whether they will do better or worse with gamma based on these data. Um, so this uh, shows the results in patients who have multiple sclerosis versus not. So the dash line again is the patients with multiple sclerosis. The solid line is patients without. Um, and this again, it doesn't show a statistically significant difference between the two groups, but you do see some more early failures in the patients with MS. Um, MS patients overall can sometimes be a little bit more difficult to treat with trigeminal neuralgia because MVD is not really a good procedure for them, and so that leaves primarily rhizotomy or, or um, you know, radio surgery. So they have, in some ways, fewer options after medical treatment. Um, they can just be a little bit more difficult to manage, and this is based on only again thir 13 patients. So it's a small number of patients um, that actually have MS. 
and, the, and what you will see in the literature, I mean, this is our particular series, which you'll see are kind of mixed results in the literature, some of which suggest maybe uh, gamma does not work as well in patients who have MS. Other reports say maybe it's similar. Um, you know, certainly when I went to my gamma training course, uh, you know, when I went to the University of Pittsburgh, they, you know, they really told us it doesn't work as well in MS patients, and so usually we'll consider rhizotomy before gamma for those patients, but it's still an option, certainly in somebody's field of rhizotomy. Um, so what we have found is that our older patients tend to do better with the gamma knife um, than the younger patients. Um, and this is if we look at a cutoff of, of 70 years. Um, so the older patients are up at the top here. Um, so more responders and less recurrence over time. There is a clear separation between those, those two curves. Why the older patients do better? I don't know they have a good, good answer, <laughs> answer for you. Um, part of that sometimes can be, um, you know, uh, we don't do it, we don't do as much gamma knife on, on the younger patients, um, and uh, ultimately, uh, you know, you can end up having less follow-up in older patients if they can die of other causes, because that's taken into account mm -hmm. in a curve like this, people dying, um, because mm -hmm. they fall off the curve for the same reason, like if, <laughs> if they mm -hmm. had um, pain, so, um, but at any rate, uh, the older patients seem more likely to respond and do have less recurrence than our younger patients. And, I, you know, it's my own personal theory, really, of how the gamma knife works. I told you it's kind of like a, a lesioning procedure similar to rhizotomy. You give that high dose rate of, of radiation to the nerve, and, you know, it's felt to kind of inactivate it. Radiation, though, when it's used to treat, you know, all kinds of things, is known to cause um, damage or, or injury to small blood vessels. So it may actually be that part of the reason that um, gamma knife works for trigeminal neuralgia is if it does cause some shrinkage of that blood vessel that's close to the nerve, that could be part of the reason why um, the radiation is working, similar to like if you did a microvascular decompression decompression where you're separating the nerve. I would expect that phenomenon, if it's occurring, to be more likely to happen in an older patient than a younger patient where the blood vessel might be more robust. Um, this shows us that if patients have a good response to the gamma knife, in other words, if you have gamma knife and your pain completely goes away such that you don't need um, medication or such that you just have occasional pain not requiring medication, that BNI of one to two, the probability that you will remain pain-free for a long time is pretty good. Um, so if after the treatment you get in that good category, you we actually get you completely off your medication, this is showing you that like 85% of those patients out to four or five years actually are pain-free. So if you respond well, which is not something you can necessarily predict before you have the treatment, the probability that you will get a durable response is, is greater versus the patients, um, this is the BNI3 patients, um, you know, we're having more recurrence over time. Um, this just shows results for patients who had a second gamma treatment. Um, and essentially, um, this just shows that the retreatment patients have done well. Um, we have typically selected only patients for retreatment that initially responded to the gamma knife. Um, so if we did gamma knife and you didn't respond at all um, and you wanted to try it again, I would, I would pretty much tell you no, it didn't work the first time, it's probably not worth <laughs> trying it the second time. We would send you to try something different. <coughs> uh, we might say, well, let's see if you could have a rhizotomy. Um, or, or something of that nature, but for the patients that we usually selected um, to do repeat BMI is a patient who responds well, um, you know, maybe they have several years of being pain free, but then the pain comes back. Those are the patients that we've usually done another BMI treatment for. Um, and I don't have a, a, a slide of it, but typically, once a patient has had the gamma knife on the MRI, you can actually see a little bit of enhancement of the nerve right where we put that shot 
of radiation. And so when we do a retreatment, we will choose a different area mm. of the nerve to treat um, based on where we see the enhancement from the original treatment. So I, I think this is actually pretty impressive that it, it can work mm -hmm. a second time. And that was my last slide. Great. Don't even have to talk over the beeps either. <laughs> All the beeps are outside. Yeah. Sorry for you, you at home that we didn't get rid of the beeps earlier. <laughs> Any questions um, from the group here? Covered it well. <laughs> Covered just about everything. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I had heard, and we got uh, IRSA, which is the International Radiation Association mm -hmm. to agree that the gamma knife is much better than the cyber knife mm -hmm. because as you cover the uh, chance of burning the brainstem, yep. which causes then more pain or numbness, which? I uh, well, could cause numbness. The numbness rate is a little bit higher in the, in the cyber knife series, but the main mm -hmm. concern is all the other things that are controlled in the cyber knife. And some of those right. side effects that I showed you in that recorded yeah. series were to structures that would not, should not really be getting significant right. radiation. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're treating someone for trigeminal neuralgia, mm -hmm. the person should never have hearing loss. I can go back to the right. slide that shows you. Well, and a lay person hears should. damage to the brainstem. I mean, that just damage to should the really brainstem. set you off. Right, uh -huh. so I, you can't see because we're at different levels, but right. so the trigeminal nerve goes this way. Okay, the nerve that controls hearing and balance goes over here. Okay, so there's, you, you shouldn't be over here. I mean, that the hearing right. nerve shouldn't really be getting radiation. But specifically, if I damage the brainstem, what happens to my body? If you damage the brainstem, it, it, I mean, it could be catastrophic. Is that paralysis, stroke? It could be paralysis, it could be a stroke, somebody okay. could stop breathing. Okay. Um, I mean, if there was significant damage to the brainstem, it controls a lot of involuntary um, okay. function. It's, it's where all of the, the roots are for all of the cranial nerves, not right. just the fifth nerve. Right. But, um, you know, so there are 12 cranial nerves. So for right. all 12 of them, and some, some of them control speech, some of them right. control swallowing, right. um, some of them control the movement of the face. Yeah. Uh, so those are the main concerns. There's a big push, especially in Florida, on the cyber knife. You know, mm -hmm. the cyber knife to rather than take your tooth out, we'll give you a cyber knife just to exaggerate. But they're they're using it for everything, including trigeminal neuralgia. Yeah. So that's one of the concerns of the national. What about the laser treatment? This group in South Carolina, and we've got a a uh, somebody here locally that's doing laser treatment for trigeminal neuralgia. Do you have any views on that? I don't know how. It how familiar I am with it, so they're using it like they would do a rhizotomy, or they're doing it more locally like an oral surgeon would do it in the office and kind of doing some kind of local nerve block. Good question, which I don't I really mean, that, have answers for. Yeah, can, that's what I'd have to check into yeah. it a little bit more. Yeah. Typically, those procedures where you're doing just a, a local injection right. or, a, right. you know, a neurectomy or something like that actually you know, yeah. cutting a, um, one of those farther divisions mm -hmm. of the nerve aren't real successful treatments. We've had uh, one of our members, Rob Rich, who some of you know, uh, just gave me an email and asked me about the laser treatment. And I know TNA, uh, the National Organization in Gainesville, has concerns about it. And as I understand it, before you leave, in other words, you stay for a week or two, it costs you anywhere from two to 40, to, I don't know, 40, that's a lot of money because they're housing you and feeding you and everything else, and you have to sign an agreement before you leave that you're pain-free. So it's it's kind of a, and, and you know, if you're pain-free in a controlled setting for two weeks, it's a little different than when you go out to live your life again, and you know you have right. stress and everything else. So I know I, uh, Rob sent me a video off YouTube, which I can show the group afterward, of a lady who's talking very positively about it, but uh -huh. there's also things out there on YouTube that are negative as well. So a lot of our okay. members are, because it's, it, you know, it sounds great, like you don't have to cut, you don't have to use radiation, you know, you just use the laser, laser and, and it takes care of it, so. Again, it's still, whether, whether it's cutting, whether it's radio frequency, whether it's a laser or some kind of coagulation, it's all still causing a lesion right. of the nerve. Right. So it's, 
right. those procedures are all you know right. similar in a way that they're causing some kind of lesion so it's not that it's not causing a nerve damage it's right. the whole point is it is trying right. to damage right. damage the the nerve how they control the laser versus with something like this oh. i can't really speak to as far yeah. as you know verifying that somebody is pain free you know, yeah. before they leave for two weeks, well, probably all of you know much better than I that the nature of trigeminal neuralgia can be very waxing and waning. And, right. you know, so just because somebody was pain free for a short period of time doesn't necessarily right. mean they, That's a concern. they, they yeah. will be at, at the four week mark. Um, well, the only concern I've really heard about the gamma knife is oh, gee, it's radiation. Oh, gee, is it going to cause cancer? Now, if you know you're 80 and you know you got 10 years at most left, you really don't worry about that. Right. But you got somebody that's in their 40s or 50s, right. that's the fear. But there's no documentation, as I understand it, that shows any concern relative to the cancer in the gamma knife, right? Yeah. Anytime somebody has radiation, theoretically, it could cause some kind of tumor. I mean, mm -hmm. that, there's just no way I can stand up here and say radiation mm -hmm. never causes any kind of tumor. But they, they generally what would tell you is that the, the incidence of people um, developing tumors after stereotactic radi radio surgery is extremely rare in the literature, especially for things in the brain. Um, the risk is probably like one in 10,000. Radiation-induced tumors, if or when they occur, usually don't happen for 15 to 20 years after someone has had radiation. So there is some um, in the literature that it may have caused it, the gamma knife may have caused it? There, I, there are really no reports specific to gamma okay. knife in yeah. the literature that have reported second malignancies. Right. But That's for, it is, it's radiation. Right. And radiation for anything theoretically, like I said, could cause a tumor. And right. I do tell you know patients that in theory, radiation could cause some time of tum type of tumor, but that sure. would be an extremely rare complication right of the treatment um you know it, in younger patients it's also people developing radiation induced cancers is also age related so the probability of someone developing an age a, a radiation related tumor is much higher if they get radiation at a very young age so that's why we're very cautious of giving radiation to children um pediatric patients so if somebody gets radiation prior to the age of 25 you know, their risk of radiation over their lifetime is going to be much higher. But what you'll see in the, you know, most um, cancers that are re reported after radiation, there's more more information on it, classically for people treated for things like Hodgkin's disease, mm -hmm. where the radiation fields were very large, covering a large number of lymph node areas that went all the way from the neck down to the chest, sometimes into the abdomen. That's gonna be the most common situation where we're gonna see someone get a radiation-induced cancer. Versus yeah. what this is, is an extremely focused radiation. You're talking about a four millimeter mm -hmm. um, area that's getting high dose radiation versus like in a Hodgkin's patient, it's over 40 centimeters, you know, mm -hmm. 60 centimeters of, of mm -hmm. radiation. So there's a very big difference. So again, I always I will tell people that there is a very tiny risk, okay. but um, you know it sure is close to zero. Yeah. Okay. All right. So are you else? saying that the glycerol um, rhizotomies are kind of being somewhat phased out, for lack of a better term? Based on my understanding, our neurosurgeons very rarely um, perform them here. I know. Um, that for a period of time at least, and it may still be that way, there was a problem with getting the type of glycerol that was actually used to perform the procedure. And I think that's initially why the glycerol rhizotomy went out of favor um, and people started using radio frequency instead. Uh, I mean, a neurosurgeon might be able to answer that question a little bit better for you. Um, our neurosurgeons, the vast majority of them that I have worked with, most of them do radio frequency as opposed to glycerol. It probably, I, I mean, uh, it's probably also a little easier to control radio frequency from a technical standpoint than a glycerol, in, in, you know, injection. Um, and I'm not a neurosurgeon, in but. In the last few weeks, I've kind of been debating between the gamma and the, and the glycerol. Who would do your glycerol? Um, I actually am, I have an somebody? appointment at U of M. Oh, okay. 
Um, you know, you need to remind me of that. We'll ask Dr. Copeland. Dr. Copeland in Midland, mm -hmm. when he came to Midland, had done over a thousand glycerols in California. So that was what, and, and he had done a few MBDs up to 100 and had problems with one or two. And so he found that the glycerol worked so well. So when he, he first came to Midland, I always say he was waving the glycerol flag until he got the gamma knife in. Yeah. And he started seeing results with the gamma knife and he said, geez, because the, the glycerol usually only lasts from six to 18 months at most. And, I uh, about it, I oh, okay, yeah. But but I should we should ask uh, Dr. Copeland because he so he's done over a thousand of them and ask why well, I don't think he's doing any anymore and I had heard the same thing they they couldn't get the glycerol it was hard to get now maybe they can get it now right I'm not sure I think it, they yeah. may be able to get it now but a lot of them don't don't do it anymore and mm -hmm. it, it, the main difference I would tell you between any kind of rhizotomy and gamma knife again is um, partially the numbness issue so with the invasiveness of the procedure you know they're going up this way through the small hole in the skull to get to the nerve um, versus we would be putting a frame on the head for for gamma knife but typically when somebody has a rhizotomy the nerves are pretty much trying to cause numbness at the time of the procedure so the rate the of numbness is you know, close to 100% versus with gamma knife, the, the risk of numbness is substantially less. It's still 25 to 30%. Now I can tell you that most patients that, you know, I've um, dealt with, regardless of which procedure it is, if they have numbness but no pain, they seem to be okay right. with yeah. that as long as it's not painful numbness. But painful numbness is something that can happen after a rhizotomy. Anesthesia dolorosa. Right. Well, the, the percutaneous rhizotomy has the highest incidence of anesthesia dolorosa, right? right? And those are the worst things that people Cause would... that Because once yeah. you have that, it's really difficult to treat. I mean, if you think trigeminal neuralgia is hard to treat, then that yeah. condition is really, that's really, not a lot. I don't know what the incidence of glycerol, uh, an anesthesia dolorosa with glycerol, I, I don't have, know. I um, have, you know, it's still, it's, it's probably, um, it's still a small percentage. I mean, yeah. in most of those rhizotomy series, it's still a pretty small percentage. Yeah. You know, it's probably ranges from 2 to 5%. Right. Right. I have some yeah. of my older yeah, slides. I took true. those rhizotomy yeah. slides out. Yeah. Um, I think I, I went from typical day to the this past month, I think. I climbed the ladder. So mm -hmm. I think I felt that the gamma knife was, I was beyond that. That's why I felt that I needed to move. Well, most neurosurgeons, and I'll see if she agrees with me, feel, and it's like Janetta really speaks to the guy that developed the MBD, if you have typical trigeminal neuralgia long enough, you're, you have a good chance of turning it into atypical. Right. Therefore, it, it's just like the fellow that started the Ann Arbor group and had Dr. Sager. Uh, he said Sager agreed with this as well, that his had more or less, as I recall, turned into a form of atypical, but he still did the MVD this on him. works with Dr. Sager that I'm going to Oh, that's right. Yeah, Bob Gould. Yeah, I put, did, you, did I put you in touch with him? Yeah. No, but Bob I Gould. wanted to get his email. Yeah, I got his email address. Yeah. I think around my, my pad I've got it. Um, so they would still do an MVD on it. Now, I don't know if that's the theory. I we think it is with no Piper. We've no difference in our outcomes yeah. between the typical and atypical patients. I mean, classically, and I've usually told people if they have atypical symptoms, the probability that the gamma knife would work is a bit lower than if you had very typical. Even if I started pain. out as typical? Uh, what I'm telling you is that uh, when we've analyzed our own patients, we haven't found a difference. Well, in other words, the atypical patients did okay. Um, but see, there's two different types of AT We've got seven new classifications, and I can't speak to which one this would be. Mine is atypical, but it has nothing to do with the vessel because it was a, a damage from an infected root canal to the mm -hmm. infraorbital branch off V2. So that's one. Mine was atypical from the start. There's mm -hmm. no sense doing an MVD or a gamma knife on it. But then there's the atypical that started as typical and, as Donetta says, progressed into. Now, again, Piper would say, and you've had the MBD, correct me if I'm wrong, he would say to you, I will treat the shocks, but I can't guarantee that it'll take care of the constant pain once it progresses. But I still think there's a good chance, just like Sager told uh, Bob Gould, and, and his MBD worked. So uh, one thing before I forget, no matter what procedure, and I think you've heard me say this many times, if you're going up to U of M, make sure that they tell you how many they've done you know, they just learned it last year and they've done 20. 
That's not somebody you want sticking a needle in your face. Right. You want somebody's done hundreds of them. And remind me, we'll, we'll email uh, Dr. Copeland because uh, he's so familiar with the glycerol. And I, and, uh, uh, I don't just. I, I just no, you want the sure appointment. I, sure. Yeah, right. But you can compare the two know answers since you get. I had you know. moved on. Right. I would say it, it doesn't do it mean camera. it doesn't mean that it, it won't work. It might mean that the chance is a little lower. Mm -hmm. um, but when we've looked at our own patients, um, we haven't found a difference. And oftentimes, mm -hmm. you know, we will get some patients that have some more atypical features because the neurosurgeons aren't crazy about doing more invasive procedures. So they wouldn't, you know, they don't want to do an MVD if somebody has atypical um, features and they might not want to do a rhizotomy. Um, so I usually tell people that the, the chance might be a little lower, but when we've actually, you know, based on other series, but when we've analyzed our own patients, the atypical patients have still done okay. Does Dr. Um, Piper do the percutaneous rhizotomies? Or is that Dr. Olsen? Yeah, he does radiofrequency rhizotomies. He does? Yep. He will do them. It just depends on, okay. you know, what what the patient is. But I can tell you that over time, I think he's changed his ways a bit because when we first started doing gamma knife, I think he did more rhizotomies. And then over time, after seeing the results of the patients doing okay and not having, you know, numbness and things after rhizotomy, he sort of switched. And patients that he probably would have originally done a rhizotomy on, you know, will get referred for gamma knife first. And if it didn't same work, as, he would try same it. as uh, Copeland and Midland. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a trend. I think at the, first, yeah. if you're a neurosurgeon, you kind of think, this gamma knife thing, it's not really going to work. Right. You know, this, you know, rhizotomy is what they should right. have. And then yeah. after seeing the patients over time and the patients tolerate yeah. the procedure well, um, yeah. they have kind of seen a switch in our own neurosurgeons, you know, yeah. over the period of time that we've had the gamma knife. Well, Copeland, now that I think about it, he had used the gamma knife for six years in California, gamma knife and the rhizotomy, and mm -hmm. he was still thinking more. And then when he got here, he was getting much better results. And the only thing he could come up with was he had a newer machine, mm -hmm. newer cobalt, and maybe just his experience, or maybe he had better radiation oncologists and people yeah, set up the plan. Sure. Are you a believer that a gamma knife is a gamma knife is a gamma knife? And my, my definition of that is no matter where you go, the results are going to be the same. I think it depends on the same. user. I mean, I think well, it's, like a, it's not like a, a surgery is a surgery is a surgery. I mean, well, I know with an MVD, but some know. places I get this, there can't be any variability because it's a machine that's accurate. The machine, the, the machine will be the same, but the, the physicians treating, could they do it slightly differently? Maybe. So I mean, could, but the, the delivery of the radiation, I mean, all the machine they have, there's a lot of cute, uh, quality assurance required of any radiation machine, whether it's a gamma knife or a linear accelerator. There are so many checks of that right. machine that have to be done in order to be for it to be used daily for radiation treatment. Mm -hmm. And that's what physicists do all day long and weekly and monthly and yearly. There are all these different quality assurance things that they have to do um, to verify the integrity of the machine. So the cobalt in one gamma knife is no different than the cobalt in another gamma knife other than the age of the radiation source. And the only thing that changes is the amount of time it takes to deliver the radiation. Um, so when the source is new, the treatment might be 25 minutes, but when the source is older, the treatment mm -hmm. might take 65 minutes, but it doesn't, it should not affect the efficacy or the effectiveness of the treatment. I you think know, what you just said is there can be variability between sites. Right, depending on the right. experience of the people using right. the machine, I right. mean, more That's than anything else. Yeah. Okay. You know. That's consistent with Copeland and Midland. Yeah. Might not be consistent with another I mean, another you, you're always yeah. going to want to, you would always like to be treated at a place that treats a lot of whatever it is you're going to have, right? right? I mean, yeah. um, if you're going to have an MVD, well, I would want to know about how many procedures, about how many MVDs did you do before you do mine. Which was why <laughs> you know? I was actually looking into Johns Hopkins to go. And they're mm. the ones that actually convinced me of doing the glycerol. Ben Carson does the Well, I hear he's retiring. He was just he on TV going into politics. Know, They're trying to push I him know. into politics. In the summer, and that's why I yeah. was pulling back from going over there. Yeah. Um, but that's who does the glycerol, or glycerol yeah. and they mm -hmm. still push them. 
In case you'll do it, yeah. yeah. So that's where I got interested in that, actually. I'm talking to them over there. But is, have they told you it only lasts six to 18 months? No. Then you have to redo it? No. <laughs> the thing to remember is that regardless of what you were to choose now, if it didn't work or if the pain come back, you would still have the alternative as an option. So if you had a rhizotomy now, it doesn't mean that you can't have gamma knife in the future. If you had gamma knife now, it does not mean that you cannot have a rhizotomy in the future. Usually the limiting factor for a rhizotomy is if they've gone in and they've done multiple rhizotomies, then a little scar tissue can form of the, over the area that they access the little hole in the skull to actually get to the nerve. So if somebody had multiple rhizotomies, it's possible that they, they could get some scarring in that path that the neurosurgeon takes to get to the right spot, such that if that was enough, they might not be able to continue to do rhizotomies. But if you choose to, to have a rhizotomy now, it doesn't mean that if it doesn't work, um, you know, or the pain comes back after whatever period of time, that you can't have given Even in what you're saying, I would rather do the gamma. It definitely sounds safer. I'm correct in the six to 18 months, right? I mean, in, Could last in general, longer, but they're yeah. going to be a little shorter. Yeah. yeah. My problem is, since I was here last, I'm like almost doubled on the Topamax, and I was Going on a high yeah. dose when I was here last month. Mm -hmm. I had a really bad month. Bad month. Since I was yeah. here. I'm on 550 milligrams of Topamax. Lucky you can walk. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So I you don't got the know that I want to stay on it that much longer. And yeah. you know, sometimes it's that I mean. Um, when people start getting side effects from the medications or the medications start impacting their quality of life, it's another common reason that why people will choose to have a procedure. It's like, you know, they're on so much Neurontin or so much Tegretol or, or whatever it is that it's affecting their normal daily living. And when it starts to do that, people would rather try to do some kind of procedure to either reduce the dose of the medications or, or get off of them, and, and it, you know, it's well, not it's saying, not well, uncommon that people will be like, I just can't take the medicine anymore, you know, and, and that's why they want to do a treatment. That's why they usually say you'll know when you want a procedure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and we'll tell people that all the time. I mean, you can yeah. come in and get information about what you know, whatever the, the treatment is. Lynn, what was your point? <laughs> yeah. What was your point? Oh, I think her, you're, the, you're your own boss as far as oh, what you want yeah. to do. Supporting you that, know, yeah. uh, um, as far as who decides when it's time. Yeah. And that, you know, that's the way it should be. Unless it's something life threatening, of course. Right. If we tell you you should do it, you should probably listen. But when it's a, you know, when it's something that's a, a quality of life issue, it's a matter of. You deciding when it's significant. well, I really don't feel like I even have the option to decide. I just know that I'm that I'm maxed at the yeah. meds right that's, now, that's where and I, I know that by fall they couldn't add more. Yeah. Think, you know, so that's where I, was. I have a son getting married next month, so I can oh, like get through that, and then as soon as that's over. Well, the stress is probably aggravating it then of well, the wedding. Well, no, I'm yeah? really not stressed about it because I'm the mother of the groom, so I don't do anything. <laughs> <You know? laughs> just show up. Show up, you know? huh? Yeah. Um, but no, I just, you know, I just yeah. feel like I need to do something once that's over. Like Who's giving you your meds? You, know? you have a neurologist? Who's giving you your um, meds? Again? Dr. Monier. Oh, that's right. Here at Beaumont, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. You're at 500, you say? Five. Fifty. Five fifty. Actually wants me to add 50 more, but I'm not doing it. Is that stopping the shocks or it's, no? No, it's not. I wake up and he prefers now added um, oxygen. Mm. I just yeah. started three yeah. days ago. Yeah, yeah but I went through, pardon me. I take one in the morning because I wake up, the mornings are still horrible. I don't know. I just added another pillow on the bed because I thought, all right, why is the morning the worst? Mm -hmm. Is it because I'm flat all night? I don't know. Because you've gone so long without the nights But I, I mean, I go 12 hours during the day. Are they 12 hours you know? intervals? Yeah. yeah. Have you so tried I, less? Yeah. Go ahead, Lynn. Sorry. Right. Tim was saying with his meds, he had shortened it to six or eight hours because it was wearing off sooner than 
Yeah, because evenings are bad too, yeah. but they're not as bad as yeah. the morning. Like I wake up at like 4 o'clock, 4.30, and it's, you know, I am getting the shots then. And the last time you took it was what time? Uh, I took it like 7.30. 7.30, so yeah. you're, eight, you're at eight hours. You wonder if the, see we used to keep, tell people to keep a diary, and if the pain's coming back, in my case it was constant pain because it was uh, opiates, uh, the PDR said take it every eight hours, but my pain was coming back in less than that, so the doctor changed it every six hours. So maybe you need to keep track of that, and he, he might change the intervals. Uh, in other words, you might spread it out, you know, the 500 and take, mm -hmm. divide it by uh, four and take it every six hours rather than taking it every 12 hours, or, or th divide it by three and take yeah, it every it, eight hours. Yeah. Yeah. Eight, yeah. You're, not, you're not taking Tobamax, are you? Are you on Tobamax? No, oh. I'm not. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm not that. I'm only taking one in the morning. Mm -hmm. Seven point five. Yeah, it's nothing. Yeah. Um, Why only once? Did he say just take it once? No, it's just me. I haven't yeah. given up about the fact that I'm taking it. Haven't you read my articles about physical dependence versus addiction? You're not going to yeah, get addicted just, to it. Just, you don't believe the articles. No, I do. <laughs> or you don't believe Tim. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just Tim's high. We don't want to get it like he is, right? <laughs> just start. You know. Yeah, no, it's hard. First step to take it. Yeah. But it's not the intent. It's not. And I don't think it works anyway. Right. It, Honestly, it's mainly the anticonvulsant for the shocks. The, the opiate or the strong med is for the constant pain. And yours hasn't yeah. turned in. Oh, you say it oh, has I turned was, into constant. Yes, yeah. No, I was. That's why you went to the opiate. And I didn't and, have it when it was yeah. in sports. I had nothing. I was. Mm. He was feeding me liquids through a straw because I couldn't even swallow. And, and I it, was how long so did afraid the, that I was getting dehydrated. How know? long was the constant bout? About a week. It was before. constant for a week? Oh, yeah. Oh, it, was, it was awful. Shock. Shocks or what type? It was constant for about a week before my before the Topamax being all kicked in. I no, it was just constant, and I wasn't I wasn't on the narcotics yet. And I should have gone into the ER, but I I was so upset because I thought they're going to force me to make up my mind of what I needed to do. Well, they can't and force I wasn't you. It's your decision. To make yeah. up a decision, so I well, just stayed just home and cried. Give you Dilaudid yeah. to get you out of the acute pain, man. And we Give you an IV. Like, I don't know what to do and, and you didn't yeah. call Lynn or me? Yeah, call Lynn, you know, she's an RN. Yeah. Go ahead and unhook. You're unhook. Yeah. Uh, we'll go into that in a minute. This young lady has to pick up her daughter. We don't want to hold her up. <laughs> How many children do you have? I have two. two. I have one. I have to get at 745. No, some of the doctors come in and their last slide is their kids. Yeah, so <laughs> so, I, I have lots of pictures of my kids. Yeah. I don't usually put them on the Oh, uh, okay. Well, we want to thank Dr. Grill. Yes. I want to get appreciation on the tape anyway, right? So. <laughs> okay, now we want to... Uh, move on to the second item on the agenda. Put it on here. Uh, new member introductions, and uh, we have a young lady who's been with us for at least 10 or 12 years, but has never been able to make a meeting. And we've got her son brought her down from Flint or Burton. And uh, Sam is a MSU medical school graduate and is now a fellow here at Beaumont in orthopedic radiology. Did I get that right? Anyway, it's Helen Yonan, and we really thank you for coming down. Uh, if we can get a little bit of your background and then the other members can chime in uh, with their thoughts on, on what you've done. And again, especially covering those injections that you got from the various dentists in Flint. Go ahead, either one of you, Sam or Helen. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I've talked to his young lady and you know, it's a long drive for them, but you can at least talk in general about the, the injections. Sam might know more about them uh, yeah. technically than you do. Right, uh, maybe I can help mom. Uh, okay.
into a light socket that usually comes, you know, maybe if you're having a, a respite or an interval period where you're not having any pain or manageable background pain, come with paroxysm, you can't eat, or if you try to eat something that's going to set off um, the pain, you're talking about trying to drink through the straw, or, okay? And uh, so that's what happens with mom. It's usually in uh, the, the V2 or the V3 distribution, which is the maxillary, the, uh, the uh, maxillary or the ventricular distribution. And mom is well, how old are you now, mom? 80? Yeah. Okay. She's, she's 80 years young. And uh, we've been very, uh, we're very conservative both. We didn't want to go with the microvascular decompression given her age and other mm -hmm. cold um, so what we had been doing is seeing an anesthesiologist in the Flint area by the name of uh, James Culver, Dr. Culver. Oh, that's right. He's not a dentist. That's yeah. right. Anesthesiologist. Well, we have. We've mm -hmm. actually tried both, both mm -hmm. groups, um, but primarily through Dr. Culver, anesthesiologist, yeah. if somebody needs that information. Uh, he's a very good guy. He's a skilled doctor. Uh, and what he'll do, uh, percutaneous procedure, entering laterally, he'll try some local anesthetic in the distribution of the peripheral nerve roots. Sometimes that helps, or it'll help to the degree where you know it's manageable. Other times, no, but it's worth a shot. It's a minimally invasive procedure. What does he use? Do you know Maricane? Or? You know, uh, I think it's a combination between a, a corticosteroid and a local anesthetic. Okay. 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 Uh, so that's what we do, and in addition, uh, we try to manage medically. With um, carbazepine or tigrepulp. Right. Okay. Sometimes we have to go a little bit above what's the recommended dose to try to control the bridge it, to try to get through it, to try to get the nutrition because sometimes if you're not eating very well, you can get dehydrated, you may get electrolyte abnormalities, and all these other things, and you can go downhill from there. But that's what we've been wrestling with the best we can for the last time. Yeah. <laughs> did did anything cause it? You didn't have a car accident or anything yeah, no, no. to cause it. Just came. Yeah, and what I do is rather than try to aggravate the situation, I put my food because I don't have the problem with the truth of what I do. Yeah. And um, I have a tooth that I should be pulled, and it's not the same side. That is my Don't want to set it off. Yeah. So I cook my <laughs> yeah, me too. I need to, I need to well, can't you put it in a mixer and and grind it up? Oh, you want? Yeah, chew some of it. Yeah. 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 Chew it. Yeah. You use Insure or any of those things for supplements? No. no. Well, occasionally, occasionally we have. Yeah. When she gets into the uh, yeah bad episodes. Yeah. That aggravates it. That, that. Oh. <laughs> Does the salt aggravate it? It's from the one, one, one thing will get you or another. I don't. I just decided I'd try it because it has a big label on it. No salt. But does the salt yeah. aggravate it, or do you just don't like the taste? No, no my, hey, my, that's oh, a separate, that's a separate issue. Yeah, the, the salt issue is a renal issue. Separate. Okay. Yeah, separate yeah. issue. But okay. you know, because like I'm thinking of Frank's diet. Is it, does that reduce oh, salt? Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. There's no chocolate. 
that's not, yeah, that's that's not, not a, a lifestyle. Yeah. I, I thought it was like I couldn't eat anything. And yeah. I thought, see, it's not going away, Frank. You know? yeah. I could eat nothing. Yeah. Know? Well, now, then she went to a dentist, right? She did go to a dentist and was eating. I didn't know you were going to ask me that question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember his name. He was just, well, he I've got it at home. Yeah. 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 Do, but what he did, uh, there was a different technique. So instead of going uh, percutaneously, The B3 division, that's the, that's the one right your jaw. Right, right. And intraorally. Through the mouth. Yeah. I don't know how well that worked for him. Yeah, it did yeah, work. Said it it did work. There was times that it did work and then it didn't work. Yeah. So, it's the same as the other way. Yeah. 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 It's just another I don't yeah. know, tool. Through the so, and it's the other one worked for at least six months, didn't it? From Dr. Culver? Oh, it worked for much longer. Longer than that? He did my mother's epidurals in her back about 10 years ago, and it was amazing. Saved her life. Yeah. Might be 15 years ago. Yeah. He's a good, he's a good guy. I mean... Uh, well, he's a specialist. They've got a center, and that's all they do. He works at, yeah. a, at a pain clinic. I also right. think he's over at Genesis, too. I don't know how he Right. Life right. Life. But they've got a center, so they're doing a lot of them. Right. Back to the point that I said to you about you and them. You've got to get somebody that does a lot of these. Yeah. What about What? Yeah, the infection will be worse. That can put you in the ground. Yeah. Just the scariest. <laughs> well, you know, what they say before you go to the dentist is try to schedule your medication, your, your carbamazepine or whatever she's taking, just before you go to the dentist to try to calm that nerve down. How bad is it? Have you had infection in it? No. No? Okay. No. It's just sore to bite on? Oh, yeah, I don't bite on it. And see, but that's the way mine started. It ended up eating right through the bone into the sinus. So, yeah, I'll give her the, the yeah the brochure. Okay. Any input for her there? You know, any? Uh, you're doing anything else, Helen? No, I'm not. Thank you for coming down. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> I don't want anything else, right? Yeah. Don't touch it, right? You're going to eat mush. <laughs> Can I get my cameraman back up here? Um, whoops. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was going to show that, but I wanted to, I was hoping Tracy was going to be here, and I say, I got lessons from the iPad to learn how to use it. I had to take care of this kid all last week while they were in Phoenix. And I wanted to show him that those well, are the we'll lessons I got. <laughs> That's my grandson. It's going all over the, the world now, buddy. The what? No, it's not. Now. It's not. No, it's not yet. 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 Not
and she has uh, agreed with this. I talked to the pharmacist who has talked with uh, Merck, I think, provides the uh, shingles vaccine that uh, it's caused by the same virus as everybody knows is chickenpox. A common complication is PRN, post-herpetic neuralgia, uh, which in effect is shingles, right? Yeah, vaccine, right, Lynn? Yeah, shingles. But is, is this shingles or is that something different no, than shingles? That's yes, shingles, that's, right? That's from the right. Yeah, okay. The, the vaccine significantly reduces disease in those 60 and older. So you only need to get it once and when you get it 60 and older. Uh, Dr. Rossi wasn't sure whether he had to repeat it. But the age is now 50. Uh, pardon? They, they, the insurance will cover it at age 50 in the bottom now. Then the CDC lowered the age. So, yeah, but it, let me go on with this. Yeah, I think I have 50 in here someplace this minute. But untreated, this here was interesting, untreated depression results in less protection in people over 60. So if they've got depression, I think that the, the article is over here on the uh, bench. Um, when if you did have shingles? Pardon? If you did have shingles, okay, can you take the vaccine or help them after you had shingles? My, yeah, that's another point. My wife had shingles when she was in her 50s, and the pharmacist recommends that she get, a, get the vaccine. She hadn't had the vaccine. So his question is, once you've had shingles, is the vaccine still applicable? And yes, because you can get shingles again. And you can get, you know, the trigeminal nerve or something, and, and that makes it even worse. I thought there was something, um, yeah, here it is. The shingles vaccine was discussed with Dr. Rossi. Uh, Dr. Rossi and my pharmacist confirmed it is recommended for all at age 50 and above, to your point, Lynn. And the vaccine is good for life. Uh, as most know, I, I just restating uh, what I said on the other one. Can you read that from where you are there? Did you read the screen? Or is it still hard? Yeah, I still won't satisfy you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay. Um, again, there's... Can you, can you it, make it larger? Uh, I think you can go like this, you mean. Yeah. But then it gets... Well, I'm just saying... Oops, get rid of that. All these strange things come out. Oh, of oh, there it is. I think you can read this one, right? Yeah. This is uh, this just restates what I had on the agenda, uh, and this is another one that covers uh, depression, and uh, depression may hinder response to the shingle vaccine. So all of you who are depressed from trigeminal neuralgia, <laughs> uh, yeah, not a funny thing. Uh, you need to get the depression resolved too. You want to read through that? The, the articles are over here on both of those are on the table over here. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm going to learn how to, uh, uh, this I just took a picture with my with my tablet. i got to learn how to um, uh, scan it and put it in and it will be much clearer. Are you reading that, Lynn? No? Mm -hmm. It's okay. I'll look okay. that. Um, here's the issue I covered in the cover letter. What you can do to, to improve your sleep. Uh, bedroom dark, none of the things we do, remove pets or pet dye. Remove, um, reserve the bedroom for sleep, and there we go. Uh, don't do a laptop. Or eat. Oh, the thing I was going to mention to you, have you tried to sleep sitting at an angle? I brought an extra pillow in two days ago, thinking Be maybe I'd, you because know, when my head up a little bit. Because when my atypical was bad, which was constant pain, I could not lay down. It just throbbed to be hell. So for a year, in bed, a I year I actually sleep. sat up with ice on my face and slept until I, you know, got it resolved after a year. Mm -hmm. So and see if that, you well, know, like different you said, positions. When I first get in bed, it doesn't hurt, but it's in the morning, early, early. That's why I'm wondering if the prone position is causing Right. So it. I'm thinking it's too many hours in a prone position. Yeah. That's or the medication issue, uh, like you said, maybe you need to take the medication in smaller intervals. Right. And you take it closer to bedtime, like it, or you put it in right. the room. No, I, I mean, come talk. Yeah, you particularly have a stump set. Right. Yeah. And then if it wakes you up and it's six or eight hours, take it down, you know, yeah. if you're up already. Uh, you need to talk to your club. Is well, there a reason with Tocomax that you can't, like, do three times a day? What is the PDR, Lynn, on Tocomax? No, I'm sorry. If I could do that, is that a point? However, you're taking it twice? I take it twice, yeah. Every 12. Again, a copy of this art right, isn't a better copy. Um, uh, copy is over here on the table. The, the article is much bigger. The other thing that I referred to, and we've had it forever in the, in the hundreds of articles mm -hmm. back there, but I got looking at this one, especially for new members. We don't have any 
on new members tonight, but this thing here, this particular four page, just covers everything that a person that's new to trigeminal neuralgia could uh, want to know. It covers the, uh, the distribution, it covers, uh, there's something up above that I can't see. Um, anyway, uh, cause of TN, who is affected, uh, how is it diagnosed, the medical treatment goes through the medications, and most importantly, the surgical treatment of TN, and it goes through all the, the surgical procedures. Uh, most of you here know this. We've got one person that's, that's relatively new. Got, these are over here, too. Make sure you get these. If, like, especially if, if there's people here without your spouse. And, and, and I don't know how you are with your spouse, but a lot of times um, you can't see trigeminal neuralgia, you know? And people think, oh, christy has got a headache. Why can't he get over this, you know? Um, Letting somebody read this, I think, whether it's your spouse or friends or anybody, you know, uh, reading this, they could understand it a little better. I don't know if it gets into uh, whether it's the worst pain to mankind in a suicide condition. I, I don't know whether it, it talks about that in the first page or not. Hey, was that from the book or is that from the No, it's, it's uh, uh, a four-pager yeah, that uh, uh, TNA distributed. Okay. And it's been around for so long. I don't know. I was going well, through it. I've seen it from somewhere. But yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, although TN is not a failed, it may be a chronic problem for the patient affect medication. Anyone else? What is TN? Yeah, here it is. Among the most uh, most acute known to mankind. Yeah, it is referred to as a suicide disease. So, you know, it covers the, the real uh, highlights of trigeminal neuralgia. Um, the last is on the back of the agendas are the schedule. The reason I haven't filled in uh, November is you wanted uh, Dr. Piper to get him. Did you get that DVD I sent you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you wanted to hear him here, though. Uh, the reason I haven't put him, I'm sure he'll come if I ask him there, I talked to Malik when I was there for an appointment. I'm trying to get Dr. Schwab here. Um, but they just got an email from uh, Sue Siri, C-E-R-R-I-Y-I, and she said, why are we covering more typical and not atypical? So I've been trying to get Dr. Schwab, who talked a couple of months ago here, who does the motor cortex stimulator. Now, I should hit up Casey. He's going to come in September. That's right, you reminded me. He does not too. I need to tell Casey to cover the motor cortex when he comes. Um, he, he wanted to cover a preview of the TNA conference in San Diego. I don't know, I may not go now. I figured if the kids were in Phoenix, I'd just drive over from Phoenix. They decided no. Oh, really? He's not going yet. It turned out a 25% increase. <laughs> when they looked at the houses in Phoenix, they figured out why. It's almost like California. You know, for 500 grand, you, you get a smaller house than what they sell for 200 here. You know? And it looks like you're in Mexico. It's Adobe. I think people must move there either for the job or the weather. You know, people retire there because of the weather. Um, but um, uh, anyway, well, they made this. Will be able to get the DVDs from, from the conference. Yeah. And they'll probably put all that on the, yeah. on the network. Oh, that's right. Pull it up like this. Yeah, but they want to charge. See, I don't know how they'll do that. They didn't charge for it. I thought they charged for something. No. Oh, we had to pay a couple years back. No? No, we had some. Okay. I uh, I uh, pulled this one off that brochure just to talk a little more. That she covered it all, but it covers this uh, the three branches, and uh, so she they're doing the gamma knife right up in here before it breaks off. Copeland's probably doing the same thing, right? Right, it's at the same spot. I just wonder whether you're paying if it's in V2, why you wouldn't do the gamma knife down here? I've asked that question before. I can't remember what their answers are. Uh, this is the. The, op the options, the three options that I put in the April letter about how to pull up the videos online. And again, if you don't have this, I can send you another one. There's option, option uh, one, option two, and option three. Uh, and it's, I wrote a note, I think maybe I covered you, Lynn, to, to John at the TNA headquarters and thank you. This is the greatest yeah. thing since sliced bread. It's saving me making 34. DVDs in real time and then mail them all. And people are, are pleased to have a computer that allows them to pull it up. They can uh, see the video. Um, yeah, this I wanted to cover a little more of the, uh, 
the options. This is what I'm talking about. An individual from TNA had set up a new group for our support group. They will provide an opportunity to upload our DVDs. Videos are available to members and anyone else interested. Uh, first option will be changed each month to provide. So I'll, I'll email when she's when she gets uh, a new uh, month up opportunity to assist other support groups around the world who are starting. We've been sending our agenda and DVDs to the one in New Jersey and one in Palm Springs, Palm Desert. Um, in the longer term, I have two discussions. She wants us to also consider, like other groups are, of using this for communication between our own group, between meetings. Hmm. I told her I couldn't commit to that. Um, I'm full up on, you know, just getting these ready every month with Lynn's help and uh, so I don't, if, if somebody thinks we really need that, you know, you can call, you've got Lynn and my number, we're available 24-7 if you've got a question, uh, whether we need them to have a uh, discussion between, I guess they must put a certain spot in whatever you call servers or whatever they are, uh, one spot where all our group would have access to and we go to discuss certain items between between groups. Go ahead, Lynn, do you have an answer for her? No, I just think some groups only need Quarterly. Quarterly, yeah. So that right. might be. Or every six months. Yeah. Right. So that's. Yeah. And some, yeah, maybe a restaurant or, you know, there right. are, have speakers. So, right. uh, what'd you find on Topamax? The half-life is 21 hours, so I would. Cameraman? I would stick with twice Yeah. Cameraman's got to take a pill. Oh. <laughs> we all walk around with our little baggies, huh? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I get it. It's okay. I'll be running out there. I'm already fast. Because he added anything else on, like a antidepressant or anything like that? He told me to do what I'm doing and then add another 550 milligrams in the morning if I needed to. And then he would, he talked about putting back up in on also if I needed to. But I just feel like I've already got what I need to do. What did you say, Lynn? What what can she go to? What are the, the intervals are eight hours? She's or twelve hours? Way over where I, she's way over it, the half life is really long, so I I wouldn't want to look at it. But is it say twelve hours in that? Yeah, twice a twice twice a day. Yeah, yeah it sounds like four hundred is where I yeah. should be top so Allowing me to go to 600. Well, so, but I had only heard that it affects glaucoma or the eyes. What else does it affect? Kidneys? It's does it say? The it is, okay. Yeah, it's good. So is he checking your blood like they do for Tegretol? He asked me if I've had blood work done, and I had blood work done in January. And, um, Might be time liver enzymes were up a little bit, but then yeah, he checked them a few days, days later. This was family practice, and they did come down, and I'm not sure why they were up, to be honest with you. They weren't up sky high, but they were up a little bit. What's that? Oh, your yeah. liver. Yeah. But it's not even processed through the liver. But I think Tocomax can mess your liver up, too, even though it's not processed. concern with me was the eyes. The doctor I told me it was eyes. I think my eyes are, but I mean, I don't I mean over a long term. Long, yeah, long yeah. term, yeah. Right. Yeah. But my eyesight's definitely not good, but I don't know yeah. if I can play yeah. that. Yeah. Well, how long have you been right. on Topamax? Um, it's recent, about enough. two years. Oh, you've been on Topamax? Oh, two years. okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All yeah, right. It's, my eyes have definitely failed. Over that time? Since I've been on it, yeah. You go to an eye doctor regularly? Yeah. Did he say Topamax could affect you? Pardon me? Yeah. How do you know? It's exactly. How do you know? You know? I mean, do you go to an eye doctor regularly? Yeah. Have you discussed the yeah, Topamax? Yeah, I told him I'm on he didn't care any concerns. No. No. He just said you have horrible eyesight. But, you, know. <laughs> so you had it before you started Topamax. Yeah. Yeah. It has gotten worse over the last two years? Yeah. Okay. Whether yeah. to blame it on that yeah. or not. Yeah. Okay. But I don't think they know to blame it on that. Well, you know. yeah, it's written up. So uh, I agree yeah. with you. My eyesight in the last two years has gotten increasingly worse. Are you on Topamax? No. I'm oh, okay. Oh, okay. Is known, well, yeah, it's yeah. it's known. That's why I looked at it because it's weight reduction for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, and and uh, yeah, it helps with weight reduction. Whereas Neurontin and the others uh, add weight, so that's the reason I discussed it. But then the uh, I read about the glaucoma issue. Pardon? They add weight. Neurontin. Oh yeah, water retention and yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I can say that to my wife. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I can't say that to my wife because she watches me eat every day. <laughs> if I didn't eat after nine or ten o'clock, it would be would help, you know. So, um, anyway, anything else we want to say? Uh, thank you for Helen coming all the way from Burton. That is great. I can't remember. Did you did you come one of the initial meetings? Did, did you come to one of the initial meetings we had? Yes. That's what I thought. Yeah. Um, oh, that's right. Sam brought you down. Yeah, Sam came with you. On the chauffeur. Yeah, that's right. I'll tell you, you know, I can't shut her up, Sam. I get her on the phone and she starts bragging about you. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I just can't shut her up. She's just uh, so proud of her son. So, anyway, thank you for coming down. But we will end it. 32. Oops, sorry. I'm sure all of us. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, yeah. we discussed that this before. Number two, or number one, we've got Lynn Rupi with us, who, to repeat it, to repeat it is, uh, is both an RN and was a dental assistant, so she's very valuable. But the other thing, we discussed that a number of times before. Helen, thank you for, for bringing that up. But... You know, it's a two-way street. I was very involved for 30 years or so at General Motors uh, in the executive group. And uh, when I went in, they recommended disability between the psychologist and the, and the pain doctor. Um, and, and I think in the last 15 years, I had 11 different assignments and reorganizing. You know, we were kind of in a downward spiral ending with the bankruptcy, unfortunately. But I was long gone by then. Um, but in the reorganizations, you're helping people with change. And... As Dr. Iani, the psychologist, pain psychologist, talked, there can't be a greater change to deal with in a person's life than severe pain. And this is the worst pain known to mankind. And he talks about the issue of we go through the five stages of grief. Even with this, we, we don't hopefully have a, uh, we have had two suicides over the 16 years, but um, we don't know if it's just directly the trigeminal neuralgia or other issues. But um, helping people adjust and going through those stages. I think if you think back, it took me about a year to get out of the denial phase, seeing Dr. Uh, Iani every month. If you need a psychologist, Dr. Peter Iani is in Farmington Hills, is one of the best doing biofeedback and that. In the second year, I went there every two weeks, and then the third year, I think we saw him every two or three months. Um, a lot of the discussion was about the sport group, not specific individuals because of HIPAA, but. But again, it's a two-way street, you know. There's reorganizations at General Motors. The feedback you get is helping people to change, whether it's their job or their location. So this was a natural transition into this. So it, it's kind of filled a void in, in my life as well, although my wife <laughs> has another perspective on that. But no, she's pretty good. She takes a lot of calls, too. And a lot of it's over the Internet, too. You know, uh, the Internet's an amazing thing. Uh, we ended this meeting a little abruptly. This is Tim Guth, just to conclude the meeting. Uh, anyone, any of our members viewing this online uh, can contact uh, myself, Tim Guth, or my co-leader, Lynn Rupi, for any questions you might have on the gamma knife topic today or um, any other subjects that uh, you have questions about relative to our suburban Detroit, Detroit General Neurology Support Group. We want to thank especially the TNA organization at headquarters for providing the um, facility in the TNA Webmaster in Denver who is putting uh, all of our uh, DVDs online, saving us time from uh, duping and mailing uh, 30 to 35 whenever we have a speaker. So congrats to uh, TNA National Organization in Gainesville for uh, their support. Over and out, Tim Booth. <laughs>